I was asked to give the high level points for um, the guidelines for mitral regurgitation, and I'll do that quickly, and I'm gonna to try to share some clinical pearls of uh, what I use when I manage some of these patients with incorporating the guidelines. Um, I have no disclosures. And um, so when we think about mitral regurgitation, yes, we think about primary and secondary MR. Um, Carpentier classification, whether you have a Barlow or rheumatic uh, valve disease, that's a disorder of the valve. And then secondary MR, we talk about chamber dilation or chamber dysfunction. Typically, this was discussed as LV chamber, but now there is an entity of what we call left atrial MR or atrial MR. Typically, this was called um, idiopathic by Valentin Fuster. But it is a real entity, and when you look at a normal mitral valve, the leaflets are flush with the valve plane. But with atrial arrhythmias or AFib, you have remodeling of the atrium so that your posterior annulus starts to move first, and over time, as the left atrium ex um, expands even more, the annulus expands, you have leaflet tethering along the LV crest of the posterior wall so that when you're in severe states of left atrial dilatation, you almost develop a pseudo-prolapse. So this is an entity atrial functional MR um, in the sense that there is data to show that putting these patients in sinus rhythm um, does reduce the amount of MR and improves their symptoms, and that also restrictive annuloplasty and tear may be an option for these patients. So knowing that we have primary and secondary MR, if you look like high level view, this was a paradigm or pyramid scheme that I borrowed from Greg Stone. Um, high level view for primary MR, it's class one for intervention to have mitral valve surgery, repair over replacement. Tier edge to edge repair therapy has now been upgraded from a 2B to a 2A. Secondary MR, you're, it's GDMT, rhythm control with AFib, CRT, all of these things, and then if still symptomatic with significant secondary MR, TIR is also 2A. So let's just go through the um, chart really quick. So with primary MR, if you have symptoms due to MR, um, it's a class one indication for an intervention. If you have some LV compromise or EF start to decline, or you have your LV end isoc dimension increase, class one indication to intervene. And then mitral valve surgery is something that you want to um, refer, repair versus over surgery. Now, when we talk about risks of patients, can they go to the operating room, there's a discussion that sur surrounds their STS score, their frailty, their ADLs, what is their cardiac condition, other comorbid conditions such as CKD, um, their ability to rehab. These are all things that are taken into consideration. And then procedure specific, has this patient had surgery before? Do they have a porcelain aorta? Have they been trached? So these are all things that decide whether a patient's prohibitive or high risk and maybe they would need a 2A indication for tier. Now, <clears throat> there's not randomized data looking at mitral valve repair versus mitral valve surgery, but the largest registry that I could find was out of the Mayo Clinic. This was from 1980 to 1995, and the um, solid lines are the patients that had mitral valve repair, and then the dashed lines are the ones that had mitral valve surgery. And they looked at these hundreds of patients over 20 years, and in all cohorts when they were adjusted for age and sex, there was a survival benefit across all the age groups when they had repair over surgery. There was freedom from reoperation, there was freedom from recurrent MR, and then there was freedom from valve-related complications. So there is data supporting these class one indications. So what about if the patient doesn't have symptoms and you know their um, LV is not compromised? If they have a less than 1% chance of mortality, they should also go to the, uh, it's considered a 2A indication. What about this thing, the progressive increase? What, it, what does that mean? Just follow serial echoes, watchful waiting? Um, Rest echoes do not elicit high-risk high features. They do not demonstrate exercise-induced pulmonary hypertension, latent dysfunction. Is there a role for provocative stress testing? Meaning, do we, could we watch these patients more carefully? And we know that 20 to 30% of patients that have moderate or more mitral regurgitation um, with reduced functional capacity, they don't do well. They have adverse events, they have decreased, more. they have more mortality. 
um, without having earlier surgical intervention. So maybe there's a role for provocative testing. So um, I give at, uh, uh, acknowledgement to Manny because in, in this uh, valve stress echo, um, they looked at patients that had symptomatic non-severe MR and then asymptomatic severe MR. So whenever there's a discrepancy between the symptoms and the valve lesions, it would make sense to consider valve stress echo. And we do that in um, two of our hospital labs here at Piedmont Atlanta and also at Piedmont Fayetteville. So we'll actually take these patients and put them on a semi-supine bike. We'll exercise them and simultaneously image their MR, their uh, pulmonary pressures, what their LV does, and, and, and monitor their symptoms. And similarly, like you could increase the incline miles per hour on a treadmill stress test, you can increase the resistance of the bike by the wattage. So we actually calculate by their age and their functional capacity what their watts would be when they do a bike stress. And what you're trying to do is query their symptoms, understand if they're having shortness of breath. You want to look to see what happens with their MR. And then you also want to look at their uh, systolic AP uh, filling systolic pulmonary pressures. What happens to the LV? Maybe their end diastolic pressures um, increase. So this is just a very crude uh, slide. Most of these patients, sh when they come to the echo lab, they already have severe MR. So we're really not sitting there when they're exercising because it's a fast dynamic test. We're not really going to be calculating the ERO. What I'm really looking for is the signal to see what their pulmonary pressures do um, and if they have symptoms and see what their LV does. So so this is something that's very helpful in terms of a risk assessment or a tool that you can use in the patients that you're kind of watchful waiting. And we followed patients with the surgeons together, and I feel like this is something in terms of a high-risk feature that you could follow these patients a little bit more closely. Secondary, secondary MR, a whole different um, beast. Um, this is where, in terms of your team, heart failure physicians, your um, EP physicians for rhythm control, I mean, you need to maximize GDMT. And after that, if they're still symptomatic, they only go to surgery if they're having a cabbage. Otherwise, tear in this po patient population is cut off down here, but it's also a 2A indication. Um, I put this slide up here for two reasons, because um, we have a heart failure panel, and for to, to get patients on four drugs, maximal doses, within 90 days of a heart failure diagnosis, to me, is close to, to impossible. Um, but they can speak more to the challenges on that. And when I was at ACC two weeks ago, they had a late-breaking trial of when they, doctors were seeing patients in the clinic and they were, you know, NYHA2, they're on a beta blocker, they would have a little epic alert come up and say, hey, you know, your patient is a candidate for MRAs. They have creatinine is this, their potassium is this. Um, and they looked at the prescription behavior between conventional practice, like seeing the patients in the clinic, and then when these epic alerts came up and they got these MR, um, um, MRA alerts that they could get the drug. And the prescription pattern went from 11% of um, prescribing MRA to almost 23, 25%. And my point in saying this is that we all know what the medications are, but in terms of the actual implementation, we don't do a good job. Um, so that's why I wanted to um, put that slide up there. Um, so again, once they've been maximized on medical therapy, they have um, tier indications both for primary and secondary MR, um, and this is all based by the COAP uh, criteria. And then um, speaking of co-apt, we now have um, five years out uh, data. And well, my friend is there. I'm so excited for him. But um, what we know is that most of that benefit from the crossover from two to three years was sustained um, at five years. So these patients did do better with tier. It was safe, less heart failure, hospitalizations, and decrease in mortality. But these patients also accrued um, Side, bad, bad outcomes, meaning in the tier group, there was probably 73% and in the control group, 92% of adverse events, meaning these patients were either re-hospitalized before five years or they died. So again, tier is not a cure, but it is definitely a tiered adjunct in this therapy for patients with secondary MR. Um, so 
evidence gaps and future directions. I just put this here for thought provocation. Pascal, we know now, is non-inferior to the mitral clip. The um, early generation of COAPT really looked at the first generation of mitral clip. What do we know about um, these newer devices and how they will perform? I didn't know, but like in the COAPT enrollment, only a third of them were on ARNIs and three out of the patients were on SGL2. What would that look like if we were practicing more contemporary heart failure regimen. All of these patients were excluded in COAPT, end-stage heart failure, atrial functional MR. And then lastly, I'm going to bring up moderate MR, just like Manny talked about moderate AS. Is there a value to looking at moderate MR in this mitral valve cardiac staging? And I'm, I'm mentioning this because you're only going to hear about it more and more. There is a staging system that exists that looks at the LV damage or LV, um, uh, uh, excuse me, LV involvement, meaning we're not waiting for an EF to drop to 60%. We look at other factors like the diastology. We look at the strain. Same thing with the left atrium, pulmonary circulation, and then the RV. Maybe looking at this is a different way of intervention than following the guidelines. And they actually did a recent paper, instead of cardiac damage, they said cardiac involvement. So, and they changed it from stage zero to great group zero. So basically it's the same thing. This is a paper by Wingarten and Victoria Delgado. And they looked at patients with severe uh, primary MR and they looked at LV involvement. Again, not LV dysfunction, EF dropping, LA enlargement, um, TR and RV dysfunction. And each of these things were associated independently with higher mortality in primary MR patients. And as I mentioned this morning, left atrial enlargement actually had a higher mortality than LV enlargement. So maybe we need to be thinking about these patients differently in, in, in the classification and how their heart responds to the mitral valve disease. So in conclusion, um, the valve guidelines are very difficult to digest, so it's good that you have a team of expertise when you go through the um, the guidelines and interpret who needs intervention. Because our treatments have better outcomes and the um, treatments uh, have lower procedure risks, there's lower thresholds for intervention. Um, and as a result, um, tier therapy, both for primary and secondary, uh, MR, bless you, have gone up to a 2A, indi 2A indication. And then my last point is con consider stress echocardiography in some of your patients that have equivocal complaints of their valve lesions um, if they need to be followed more closely or watch um, an earlier intervention. Um, thank you for your attention.